and give an introduction to caesural contact topology, but I'm by no means a contact topologist or a caesural contact topologist. And I've done almost uh, I've done almost no work in in caesural contact geometry. And in fact, caesural contact geometry is a field that's you know uh, it, it's kind of hard to find experts in it because there are not too many people who actually work in the field full time. Uh, it's, it's a rather, I'd say, unexplored field that, uh, that you know, is waiting for, for people to go in and, and explore. Now, as I said, I, myself, uh, I, I'm not a C-zero contact topologist. I'm a C-zero symplectic topologist. This is where I've done my work. So what I plan to do for today's talk is uh, I'll tell you, I'll give you an introduction to C-zero symplectic topology, and, and then in analogy to that, in analogy to some of the results that have been obtained for in C0 symplectic topology, I'll proceed to state some open problems in C0 contact topology. Okay, so that's that's my plan for the talk. And I apologize to those of you who are hoping to learn about C0 contact topology. Unfortunately, I can't tell you much about the subject. Okay, so let me begin with an introduction to C0 symplectic topology. So here's a bit of notation. Uh, I start with a symplectic manifold M omega, and I denote the set of automorphisms, so the group of automorphisms of the manifold by simp of M omega. So this consists of those diffeomorphisms of the manifold, so those phi, which preserve the symplectic structure. And here's something, uh, a point that I just want to drive home, so I'll draw it in, Eng in, in English, to write in, and write it in red. Uh, so this uh, this property, when, when you say phi preserves the symplectic structure, when you say phi star pulls back the symplectic form to itself, you're talking about the derivative, der derivative of the map phi. So this is a property of d phi. To just make sense of the symplectomorphism, you need your map to be differential. So when you first hear the words C0 symplectic topology or con uh, continuous symplectic topology or symplectic homeomorphisms, you know, those words should come as a surprise because what do we mean by a symplectic homeomorphism? How could a symplectic homeomorphism preserve a symplectic structure? And so I'm going to begin my talk by explaining to you how we make sense of that notion. So what allows us to do this is a rather famous theorem. Uh, I'll switch back to black. So it's a famous theorem uh, uh, called the C0 rigidity theorem. And it's due to like a lot of other stuff in symplectic and contact topology due to Eliashberg and Gromov. And it's got a nice and interesting history. I'd say the proof began in the early 1970s and it was finished in the early 1980s. So I'll say a little bit about the history behind the theorem, but here's the statement. You take a sequence of symplectomorphisms phi i, and let's suppose this sequence converges in C0 topology to phi, okay? So this is the topology of uniform convergence, the compact open topology. And you know, this is the, the C0 convergence a priori carries no information about the derivatives of the limit map. So in fact, this phi might turn out to be non-smooth. So now I want to ask if phi is symplectic or not. So what I'm going to suppose is that phi is differential. So suppose phi is a diffeomorphism of it. And now the question is, is it symplectic or not? And what Gromov and Eliashberg showed that is that, in fact, this is true. If phi happens to be differentiable, then, then it is a symplectic map. Okay. Here's, a, here's an equivalent way of stating the same theorem, which is, it's often stated in this way, simp, the group of symplectomorphisms, is C0 closed in, in the group of diffeomorphisms. OK, again, so I, I've said this several times, so I'll repeat it one more time. Uh, what's remarkable about this theorem is the fact that you're looking at C0 convergence here. This is a very weak form of convergence. A priori, it should carry no information whatsoever about the derivatives of this limit map phi, but hey, it happens that it does, and phi turns out to be symplectic. 
Okay. Now, as I said, this is, uh, before I tell you what symplectic homeomorphisms are, let me tell you what's some of the motivation and the history behind this theorem. So historically, this is actually a very important theorem in the development of symplectic topology, not just C0 symplectic topology. It, it, you know, it's chronologically speaking, the first major theorem uh, of, of the field of symplectic topology. Okay, and so here is what it goes back to. So in the 70s, early 70s, before the statement of the theorem was known, Gromov was considering the closure of symplectomorphisms. So this is the C0 closure taken inside the group of diffeomorphisms of the manifold. So a priori, suppose we don't know the statement of the theorem, this sits somewhere in between symplectomorphisms, obviously contains all symplectomorphisms, and obviously is contained inside the group of diffeomorphisms. Now we could say a little more, uh, you know, every symplectic manifold comes equipped with a canonical volume form, omega raised to the power n, and symplectomorphisms preserve this volume, this volume form. And preserving volume is a topological property. So a C0 limit of volume preserving maps is always volume preserving. So we know that actually it sits somewhere in between. And the question Gromov was interested in, well, where exactly in between the two does it sit? Could it be bigger than SEM, or could it be somewhere in between, or could it be all of volume preserving diffeomorphisms? And in the early 70s, he proved his very famous uh, Gromov, the Gromov alternative. So the Gromov alternative. And here's what he proved. So one of the following two statements always holds. One, either simp can coincides with its closure, simp r. So you get nothing new in the closure. And this is what Gromov called the rigid or the hard alternative. This is this would be demonstrate hardness of symplectomorphisms. Or if this fails to be true, so if simp r happens to contain just one object that's not symplectic, then it must contain everything. Then it must be all of volume preserving diffeomorphisms. Okay, so you and this is what Gromov called the flexible or the soft alternative. So you either get nothing new or you get everything. And, and so this was done in the, uh, let's say, I think it around 1970. And around 10 years later, Ilya Ashberg resolved the alternative, uh, as I just said, as the statement of the theorem makes it clear, in favor of rigidity. Okay, so that's, that's the history of the problem. And uh, the question, uh, this theorem, uh, this interplay that you see here, between the contrast, between softness on one hand, hardness on the other hand, has become one of the major themes of symplectic topology and contact topology. And we are always trying to find out where the boundary between softness and hardness is. And, and as you'll see, this also permeates to C0 symplectic topology and C0 contact topology as well. That's kind of one of the main themes of the field. Now, uh, are there any questions about the theorem or, or the or the history that I put here? Any comments? Okay, so as I said, this this allows us to make sense of symplectic homeomorphisms. One of the some of the heroes of today. So we say a homeomorphism phi is symplectic. If, and I, I bet you could uh, guess what definition is, if you could find a sequence of symplectomorphisms, so smooth guys, uh, which converge uniformly to phi. Okay, so a symplectic homeomorphism is, is something that can be written uh, as the uniform limit of, a, of symplectic diffeomorphisms. Uh, Maybe I'll introduce a bit of a bit more notation. Uh, usually, the set of all so symplectic homeomorphisms, uh, well, all denoted by simp bar. Just to so this simp bar is a little different than the previous simp bar. Here I'm taking the closure inside homeomorphisms. So 
this is the set of all symplectic formulas. Okay, so I, I, I like this notation that it, it signifies the fact that we're just looking at the C0 closure of symplectomorphisms inside the group of homeomorphisms of the manifold. And to give you an example of what you could get in here, so this sits inside homeomorphisms. Uh, so here's an example. If you take a, a very important example to the field is if you take sigma to be a surface, so with an area form, that's a symplectic manifold, then simpar is just simply the group of area preserving homeos of the surface. Okay, so that's a, that's kind of an important class of examples to C0 symplectic topology. Uh, maybe I'll give one more notation just because it might come up later. There's an analogous definition for Hamiltonian homeomorphisms. So there's a notion of Hamiltonian homeos. I won't write down the definition because I think you could, well, it's C0 limits of Hamiltonian diffuse. Okay, so in this definition up here, where I had symplectomorphism, just take Hamiltonian diffuse, and then what you get in limit is called a Hamiltonian homeomorphism. And these are objects that are also studied in, uh, in, in, in dynamical systems a lot, especially in the case of surfaces. And we grouped in the group of all Hamiltonian homeomorphisms in this way. Okay. Now, one of the main goals of C0 symplectic topology is understand these objects. So what the goal is, we want to understand uh, is symplectic homeomorphisms or Hamiltonian homeomorphisms. And, and the basic questions are, well, there are two dominant themes in the field. On one hand, we want to see in what way symplectic homeomorphisms are different than smooth symplectomorphisms. Can they do things that smooth symplectomorphisms cannot do? Or, you know, what, I'll make this more precise later when I start about talking about open problems. Or, or we want to see to what extent they actually see the underlying symplectic structure. And the second thing, which maybe won't come up, it will come up a little bit in my talk later today, uh, later on, is the dynamics of these objects. This has been in particular interesting in dimension two, where you, know, you could apply tools of symplectic topology to study area preserving homeomorphisms. Okay, so that's my brief introduction to C0 symplectic topology. Now, if there are no questions, then I I will go on and say what C0 hey, I, have, topology I have a question. Yes? Yeah, sorry, because I'm, I'm receiving phone calls and I, I have not been following everything, but maybe you you talked about this, but you say that uh, the limit, so the, the map you're looking at is a homeomorphism. Um, uh -huh. If um, if you had a, a sequence of uh, symplectomorphisms converging in C0, yes, uh, the limit would not need to be homeomorphism or something. It could just be some continuous map or... Right, right. It could be non-invertible. So I say th that's why the definition assumes that's a good point. So maybe I'll underline it. Since I like switching colors. I say for, I take a homeomorphism file. I suppose it's a homeomorphism okay. mm -hmm. to begin with, and then I say it's symplectic if it can be written as a limit of symplectic diffeomorphisms. But mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. In the limit, you might get an object that's not invertible. But would it still be something special, or can it be any? Any continuous map somehow, or I don't know, some. So I've thought about it. Let, I mean, it could be obviously not any continuous map. Mm -hmm. so what happened to my. OK, not any continuous map. Uh, it, it, it still has to. Uh, I mean, it still has to be volume preserving. Mm -hmm. uh, it could do certain things. I mean, I have examples, for example, uh, on, on small enough subsets, so on an isotropic submanifold, for example, it could do pretty bad stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, in one of our papers, we construct a map, like you say, that uh, takes a, a tree or a, let's say a line segment, like a curve in the manifold, and shrinks it to a point. So you could do that, for example. This sort of thing you could do. 
But anyway, this limit map, whenever it's smooth, it would have to, if it's differentiable at a point by the gros mont ashberg theorem, it would have to be differentiable at that, it would have to be symplectic at that point. So if it's differentiable at a single point, then the derivative is actually uh, invertible and symplectic if you want. Okay, uh, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the question. Actually, there's maybe a clarification I should make about the definition is, so, the, you know, the theorem, the rigidity theorem, uh, tells us that this definition is kind of a reasonable definition, because if I take a smooth symplectic homeomorphism, then the rigid, the, you know, you would want it to be an honest symplectomorphism, and the rigidity theorem tells you exactly that. Well, you see there's a bit of a delay between what I say and what appears on the screen. Okay, well, thanks for oh, the question. I'm sorry, so someone, you stop me as often as you want. A quick question. I'm sorry? I have a quick question. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, is it, uh, in the case of a surface, is it easy to see that every uh, area preserving homeomorphism is a limit of the smooth uh, symplectomorphisms? I, not immediately. This is a well-known result. Uh, uh, I, I, I can't even remember if the proof is written anywhere, but it's suddenly a well-known result. But whether it's, uh, you know, is it easy to see or not, depends on uh, how used to you are, used you are to the arguments that are used in the proof of it. If you're not, if you haven't seen the arguments, I'd say no. The way it works is that you, you take an area preserving homeomorphism, so you need to know you could approximate it by area by diffeomorphisms. Okay, so you take a diffeomorphism that's C0 close to it, then uh, this diffeomorphism almost preserves area. It pre you know, it's area preserving up to a bounded area, and then you try to fix it. Uh, make it area preserving. It involves arguments with the Moser method and so on. So I, I would say it's not completely, it's, it's not, it, it, it's not easy to see. Uh, you know, it's easy, it's the sort of thing that's easy to the experts, but not if you've not seen the argument before. Okay, thanks. You said the hard part is proving that the homeomorphism can be approximated by diffeomorphism and the volume preserving part is easy. It's easier, yeah. So you, you need right. You need to know that you could approximate uh, uh, homeomorphism by diffeomorphism, and that's known in dimension two. Yeah, and there is a very nice survey paper by Alan Hatcher, the, the same one who wrote the famous algebraic topology book and proved the Smith conjecture uh, about this topic: smoothing in dimension two, existence and uniqueness of smooth structure on topological surfaces, right. and approximation of homeomorphisms by. Uh, Diffeomorphism. This is a really nice paper, very much worth reading. Uh, yes, I've seen it actually. Uh, so there's a paper of Hatcher. Do you remember what the title is? Maybe I'll just put it here in case since you suggested it. Something about, uh, well, on approximation of, on smoothing Homeos in dimension two. So the title is the Kirby Torus trick for surfaces. Right, the Kirby right. Torus. That's that's exactly right, right. Because he wants to explain how you can downgrade the Kirby stuff uh, from higher dimensional uh, geometric topology to dimension two, and I I've put the link in the chat. Great, right. thank you. Okay, any other questions? So now we go into a bit of C0 contact topology, and here is where I know a lot less. Um, so the story in the contact setting is actually, at least the beginning of the story, is very, very similar uh, and very much parallel to what happened in, in the symplectic setting. So let's say you have a contact manifold, Y, and, and then I denote uh, the group of Again, you have the group of contact amorphisms of Y. So as I'll write the definition just to emphasize the fact that you to speak of a contact amorphism, you need the map in, to be differential. Right? These are maps that preserve the contact structure. So again, this is a, a C1 property. So once again, if you want to make sense of contact homeomorphisms, you need a rigidity theorem like the one I stated for simple ectomorphisms, and, and that theorem exists. So again, there is a theorem uh, 
by again it's, it's called I, I believe it's called the Caesar rigidity theorem again and it's by the same guys Lee Ashberg and Gromov and it says well the group of contact morphisms is closed or C0 closed inside the group of diffeomorphisms. So if you take a C0 limit of contact morphisms, what you get uh, is again a contact morphism. Okay. And the story here is, is very much parallel. So there is a, a same, I'll just say same story as above. So there was a Gromov alternative and it was resolved in favor of rigidity uh, by Eli Ashman. However, I, I think this is actually uh, kind of re has remained remained a folklore theorem for the longest time, I and mean, everybody believed it. But I'm actually not sure when the first proof was written. Uh, the only proof that I know, so this might demonstrate how unfamiliar I am with the literature on uh, contact topology. The only proof that I know of, or I've read actually, is the one due to by these two guys, Muller and Spath, and it's on the archive. And you could see it was put on the archive in 2013. Now, so again, you could define contact homeomorphisms. Uh, so we take phi, a contact, a, a homeomorphism phi, and I say it's contact, is a contact homeomorphism if it can be written as a limit of contact morphism. So if there exist phi i contact homeomorphisms which converge to phi in C0 topology. Okay. And again, this definition makes sense because if you have a, a, a smooth contact morphisms, what you have is, is nothing exotic. It's just a, a good old contact morphism. And so I, I suppose the goal of zero contact topology, at least one goal of the field would be to understand these guys. Or they, you know, there could be, there, uh, the field is so unexplored, I'd say, that it's open. You could interpret it however you want. But one good goal would be understand these contact homeomorphisms. And I guess one question that comes to mind right away that maybe it came up in the discussion group in the problems, uh, the, the working group I was in yesterday, you know, you have this, so, uh, so I'll, I'll denote, uh, oh, I, I forgot to introduce the notation contact. So I, I'm gonna denote the set of the group of contact homeomorphisms with the same notation. So con with a bar above it. So this is contact homeos. And so here is a problem zero. Maybe someone here already knows about this. So we had this notion of bi Lipschitz homeomorphisms that came up earlier uh, in the workshop. Uh, and it would be good, it would be interesting to know if these coincide with contact homeomorphisms. Well, they can't coincide with contact homeomorphisms. But it would be no, good to know if bi Lipschitz homeomorphisms, uh, which preserve a, you know, which arise uh, of a contact manifold, uh, which arise from a sub Riemannian structure on it, uh, are contact homeomorphisms in this sense. So, what's the question should be? Bi Lipschitz homeos. I don't know. I, rem I don't remember whether this was what the notation for that was. But are these? Can you approximate them by contact on this? And so we had a bit of a discussion on this yesterday, and, and, and I think we had a bit of a, maybe we were a bit optimistic that this could be done if the bi Lipschitz homeomorphism. So the question is asking, can you approximate the bi Lipschitz homeomorphism by contact homeomorphisms? Uh, and uh, a bi Lipschitz contact homeomorphism by contact homeomorphisms. And, and, and I think we, we got the feeling in the discussion yesterday that maybe if the bi Lipschitz homeomorphism is isotopic to the identity, then it can be done. Uh, so that's an interesting open problem. So I start with problem zero. Okay, uh, wait. so now what I'm going to do, uh, 
for the rest of my talk is I'll tell you about what I know. So results in C0 symplectic topology. And then in analogy to these results, I'll formulate some uh, problems in C0 contact topology. Okay, so that's that's the plan for the rest of the talk. So the first thing uh, that so I already used up problem zero. I wanted to that should have been problem negative one, but okay. So here is problem zero, but it's problem one. But this this I know the answer to. So the first result I want to tell you is uh, is a theorem of Ludenbach and Sikorov, which motivated uh, my research for several years. Uh, here's an interesting result they proved about Lagrangians. Suppose L is a closed manifold. And uh, let's assume further that you have a sequence of embeddings, Lagrangian embeddings of L into uh, you know, your favorite symplectic manifold. So Lagrangian embeddings. And Furthermore, let's suppose these embeddings converge uniformly to, to an embedding, to another embedding F, so a smooth embedding F. And, and I, I'm assuming that F is smooth. Right, so I have a sequence of submanifolds that uh, Lagrangian submanifolds that are converging as embeddings to some smooth submanifold. And, and I think you could guess what the question is or what the result should be. The question would be, is the limiting object Lagrangian? Is the, are the Lagrangian embedding C0 rigid? And I might be missing some technical assumptions, but that's not too important. What they showed is that this limiting object is indeed Lagrangian. F is Lagrangian. And so this what, what this tells you is that once you, if you have and closed here is extremely important, otherwise it's just not true. So the property of being a closed Lagrangian embedding is C0 origin. Okay. And maybe the remark I'll make here is that L closed is absolutely necessary. Otherwise it's false. You can construct examples of Lagrangians that converge to symplectic submanifolds. And, and here's the question. The so question, does the contact analog of this, this is something I'm going to spend some time on today, does the contact analog hold for the genres? Um, so, Van, there's a question on chat by Enrico. I think Enrico, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Yeah, I was um, I was confused because um, in uh, if you have a curve, um, a horizontal curve in a sublimanian manifold. Uh, I mean, if, if sorry, if you take the space of horizontal curves with these, you can any other smooth curve. Right. So this is. The answer is no to this, yeah, exactly for the reason you said. The answer is no, uh, because you can approximate any curve. So that, that's why I'm going to call this problem zero. Maybe I should call this actually problem negative one because it's so known. Uh, so that problem zero was already taken up. You can approximate non legendrians any curve, as you said, by Legendrians. I, I, I can also do this with closed curves. No? Yes, but those are Lagrangians, not Lagrangians. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. If so, a, a curve in the plane is a Lagrangian. So this theorem, uh, lodenbach sikorov in dimension two, is just vacuously true because every curve is a Lagrangian. Oh, I see. Now I understand. So, but the point you brought up is, is is a great point. I mean, the the analog of the symplectic result. So this is the the, the symplectic result is here. The analog of the symplectic result in the contact setting is just plainly false. It, it, it's just so clearly false. So it has no hope of being true. Although I, I have to say, 
so one might try to pose, impose some conditions to push the uh, Lodenbach Sikora proof through. Uh, and I thought about this for some time uh, many years ago, but I wasn't able to figure it out. But I, I believe that this is the name. Uh, I, I think I saw the person yesterday in the group here. Nakam Lucas Nakamura has a nice paper that that shows uh, that shows under some assumptions, which I, I won't go into. You could make this through. So you could impose some assumptions on your sequence of Lagrangians and so on, uh, some rather reasonable assumptions. Uh, then the result becomes true. Then the limit is Legendre. OK, but what I want to do is take this as motivation to say, pose a question about contact homeomorphisms. OK, so now we get to the first real open problem that I want to state, or the set problem. That was problem negative one. We had problem zero. And here we get to problem one. Now, here's the result uh, in C0 symplectic geometry. So this was a joint paper I wrote with uh, uh, Humilier and Leclerc around 2013. And it's a version of the same lodenbach sikorov theorem. So let L be a Lagrangian, a Lagrangian submanifold. And this time, I don't assume it's closed, not necessarily closed. This is one of the main features of this theorem. Okay, and now suppose you have a contact, a symplectic homeomorphism. And let's suppose this symplectic homeomorphism. So I, I look at the image of this Lagrangian submanifold under my symplectic homeomorphism. Okay, so it could be something non-smooth. I want to ask if it's Lagrangian or not. So let's suppose it's smooth. Then the conclusion is, Phi of L is Lagrangian. Okay, so uh, you see that symplectic homeomorphisms actually preserve the property of being Lagrangian, regardless of whether Lagrangian is closed or not. Okay. And now, saying, so if, if we focus on the case of closed Lagrangians, obviously this follows from the Lodenbach Sikora theorem. Because every symplectic homeomorphism is a limit of symplectic diffeomorphism, so this phi of L can be written as a limit of Lagrangian embeddings. But we saw that the lodenbach sikorov theorem has no chance of being true without imposing assumptions in the context. And maybe, and here's, a, I think, a very nice open question, is does the contact analog of this result hold for Legendre's? So question, so this is problem one. The question does, Contact analog, again, hold for a genre. Every question I put basically is going to be like this. Contact analog hold for the genre. Uh, right, so so just to, since this is, I think, a really important question, I'll, I'll spell it out. So I, I take a contact homeomorphism and the Legendre and L. And I suppose, uh, I suppose phi of L is smooth. Does this imply that phi of L is Legendre? And that I think is kind of a fantastic question. And there are, there are, has been, so this, this is a question that has, is I think, kind of well known, at least to some people in C0 contact topology. And, and uh, there, there is some work that's been on, done on it. And, and maybe I'll say what is known about the question. So I'll leave it here. And, and so uh, here, let me just say, answer is yes. Uh, so answer. Answer is conjecturally yes. And my expectation is, I, I don't know, for the longest time I thought it was no, but now I've started to suspect that it could be true because of some recent developments. So answer is yes uh, in the following cases.
So uh, maybe I'll tell you what cases, well, just to prepare you, uh, I could give you a bit of notation on what is, to tell you about what sort of thing is known about this question. Are there any questions about the question itself? Uh, maybe I have a small question. Um, is it clear that, that there are examples where the closure of uh, contact maps uh, have something else than accept contact maps? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. So is this a closure of contact maps strictly larger than the contact? Uh, I mean, it's in the sense that it contains homeomorphisms. You could get non-smooth objects in there. Yeah, this is the question. Can you really have them? Non-smooth objects? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, I mean, you could just uh, just introduce singularities by taking C0 limits. Uh, and uh, as I said, I think yesterday, well, maybe this is far less clear, but I think you could get a lot of bilateral homeomorphisms, for example. We, yeah, I mean, to comment on this from what we said yesterday, we know two ways, I think, of constructing um, kind of by Lipschitz maps. And one of them is lifting from the plane. So you can use kind of approximation of area preserving things on the plane by diffeos to, I guess, get an approximation of this type, right? And so all those by Lipschitz things are, in fact, limits. And there's this construction by Patrick of other more sophisticated stuff. And I think that's also a limit, right? So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you saying a, a bi Lipschitz area preserving homeomorphism lifts to a bi Lipschitz contact homomorphism? I think that's what we said yesterday in the group. Okay. Uh, okay. I don't know. Uh, it seems reasonable. Uh, and then yeah. you should be able to. There is there is a reference to a paper by uh, Balog and collaborators in my uh, in my text on this topic in my habilitation thesis. Okay. Okay. Great. So there are plenty of these objects. Um, so sorry, sorry. A question. Hi, Sovan. Uh, so if, if you take, so I didn't uh, have time to follow too much with by Lipschitz. But if we take a non non smooth by Lipschitz that is approximated by smooth ones, just just smooth maps. I mean, you take some uh, Riemannian manifold, approximate a non smooth by Lipschitz by uh, smooth. Isomorph uh, something and lift as a contact elements. Is that then an example? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think you need, right, that uh, the derivative should be Lipschitz or something like this, right? Like you should have like a C11 kind of thing that you lift, perhaps. Um. Yes, but the convergence to a by Lipschitz non-smooth map below somehow. Doesn't that ensure that? OK, maybe not. That's, that's, that's uh, if we don't know yes or no, then just think about it later. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know. I, as I said, to be honest, I, I've thought very little about contact homeomorphism. So I, I can't do much more than stating open questions. But anything you ask? I, I, I can state the theorem, if you want, Jorge. So the, the paper is by Balog, Ofer, Isenegger, and Tyson in 2006. It proves that a Lipschitz map of R2 uh, such that the um, almost everywhere is uh, it's differentiable and has a constant uh, uh, Jacobian, constant uh, determinant of the differential, leads to a unique Lipschitz map in the Eisenberg group. Ah, so, so for instance, if you simply start with a map which is sends xy to x plus g of y, comma y, for any Lipschitz g, uh, then it leaves. And that's yeah. an example of contact on your There are examples and there are, there are papers published about examples. Okay. Do you put can you did you put that in the in the chat, Patrick? Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So I was gonna tell you guys about what is known about this question. Um, so uh, so just to give you some notation, pick. And this is where you know, the, the problems with approaching this problem actually start to appear. Pick, so pick a contact form alpha. You know, kernel of alpha gives you the contact structure. 
And um, uh, if you look at, the, if you pull back the contact form by these contact morphisms, so I start writing my, con I, I write my contact homeomorphism by, as a limit of, I pick a sequence which converges to it. Now pull back the contact form. This is going to pull back to another contact form with this giving you the same contact structure. So it's going to be of this form, e to the gi alpha. This GIs uh, are called conformal factors. And the conformal factors are actually, the, the, having no control on these things is what makes the problem so hard, at least what made it hard for me. So conformal factors. It turns out that if you could assume some sort of control on these guys, then you can prove things. Uh, so for example, case one, uh, Rosen and Zhang have a paper which outlines the argument. Uh, if you suppose the GIs have a C0 limit to some map G, so G, a continue, G would have to be a continuous function G, then, then the answer is yes. Then, uh, then phi of L is Lejeune. And so, for example, what this assumption, what this assumption allows you to do is um, it allows you to lift the problem from the contact manifold to its symplectization. And uh, so, you know, you could show that the lifts of these contact morphisms, well, the lifts of these contact morphisms lift to symplectic diffeomorphisms of the symplectization. And then this assumption that the GIs converge tell you that in the limit you obtain a symplectic homeomorphism of the, the symplectization, and, and, and then you could deduce the result from uh, what is known in the symplectic setting. So this sort of assumption always allows you to, to lift the problem, to transfer the problem to the symplectic setting. Uh, so you could weaken this. Usher has it. So this is about 2018. Case two is a result of Usher uh, from 2020, where he just showed that you could even weaken and assume that GI bounded near a, maybe his assumptions are even weaker than that but i can't remember but that's that's the basic idea so you could assume gi is bounded near l and, and this still allows you i don't think usher's proof goes through that way but this sort of assumption still allows you to make a symplectic push a symplectic proof go through and now finally uh, the 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 only result that i know of that really doesn't assume anything about this contact, this conformal factors. So I, I, I'm not, I, I think these uh, assumptions on the conformal factors are not optimal. And right? one should be able to prove this without, uh, I, well, it could be false, or if hopefully, well, now that it's turned out to be true in dimension three, turns out you could remove these assumptions on the conformal factors. Uh, and for that, you'd need a purely contact proof. And this, uh, I'm not sure if it's actually been publicly made available, so Jurgis could tell us. So Dimitroglou, Rizzle, and Sullivan proved it in, in full generality in dimension three, so without any assumptions on uh, on the conformal factors. Okay, so this is the only result that I know of. So it's very nice. That doesn't assume anything. That, does, that really uses purely contact methods, the Giroux's uh, convex surface theory to, 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 to make things go through. It doesn't appeal to symplectic geometry to prove it. Uh, this is, this is uh, unfortunately not up yet, but it, it's a short paper, but it's a very, the, 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 new, the new ingredient is pretty small, but it's coming. Okay, but it's, it's not on the archive yet, right? No, it's not, okay. Should have been. May I ask a question? So. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, so this result by Dimitri Gris and Simon, does it hold only for closed Legendrias or for every? So maybe Jorgos could tell us. The yeah. Proof Jorgos yeah. presented was for closed Legendrias. Yes, I, I, I didn't think about the a priori need some kind of assumptions then if you want it to hold for. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know. But, but presumably you could extend it, but I didn't think about it. Okay, that would be worthwhile because it might uh, help with the another problem that's coming up. I, think I told you about. Okay. 
So for the, actually for the longest time, uh, how much time have I taken up by the way? So, so Van, I mean, in principle, you had to finish at uh, at 30 past, right? But you should have like 10, 15 more minutes due to the delays, I think. Oh, OK, OK, OK. But even if 15 more minutes, I'm a little running behind schedule. So maybe, maybe I'll I mean, say. I think like you should ex expect to finish at the F45 or so. OK, that's good, that's good. So uh, before this, I learned about this result by Jorgis and, and, and Sullivan, uh, you know, for a while, uh, Bohovsky and I thought that we had a counterexample of this, although we never wrote it down. So uh, I guess good thing. Maybe it's a good thing we didn't write it down. <laughs> we, we never checked the details, but we were we were somewhat convinced that one should be able to find a counterexample, uh, and we thought we had like a, a, a contact homeomorphism that could send a non Lejeunean knot to something non Lejeunean. Uh, and I'll tell you. Why? So, Van, so do, do you know that we bet a beer with Lev uh, when he first told me this in uh, in Uppsala, and I, I bet him a beer that he, he couldn't be able to prove that because uh, it was yeah, clear so to me that the smooth limit of a legendary, uh, C0 limit of legendary is legendary. And, and then, he, then he sketched me your constructions. I, I pointed out why it can't work, and, and then he disappeared, and I never got my beer. Ah, uh, well, I, I can get you a beer if you want. I, I'd be happy to get you a beer. Uh, but I actually talked to Lev recently about this, and he uh, he's now uh, fully convinced that the construction was wrong. And he thinks actually, now he's gone the other way around. He, he believes that the results should be true in all dimensions. Okay. Uh, but I mean, I'll say why, uh, just to maybe why the result could have, we thought the result, the result, it's not obvious that the result should be true. Part, one reason could be, we could say, look, you look, Lodemov Sikorov is true in symplectic setting, but it's not true in contact setting. But there's also some interesting examples uh, uh, in the symplectic world that motivates why one could potentially hope to find a counterexample, although now people are starting to be optimistic, about, uh, pessimistic about finding a counterexample. So maybe phi is non Lejeunean. And what motivates this is. A result to Lev, uh, due to Lev and uh, so Bohovsky and Opstein in the symplectic set. So, Patrick, I'll, I'll get you a beer next time I see you. Yeah. So, there exist symplectic homeomorphisms of R2n, or say R6, so as long as the dimension is above 3, with the following property. Uh, which map a symplectic disk to a isotropic disk to an isotropic disk. And, and so, you know, what we thought initially was that the same sort of techniques could prove that a non a Legendrian knot could be mapped to a non Legendrian, but hey, it looks like it doesn't work out. Okay, so, so anyway, I think this is a really fascinating problem. Uh, it would be nice to see, I'm very happy to see that it's done in dimension three, and it would be nice if it, it could get done in higher dimensions as well. Um, now, this question, so here's a little bit on why I uh, Jorgis's result at the moment is only for closed knots. While here's some reason I have for why I think it would be nice to have it for non-closed knots as well, non-closed Lejeunes as well. And that's because of so the next problem. So uh, problem, uh, I forgot what problem we're at. Problem two or three now. Problem two. There's a co-isotropic version of all this. Okay, um, so this theorem that I proved with Humilier and Leclerc in 2003 has a co-isotropic version. Suppose, so maybe I should recall what a co-isotropic manifold is first. So recall a, a sub-manifold of a symplectic manifold is co-isotropic if it has the following property. So for each point on the submanifold, you look at the symplectic 
Uh, I guess I should write this further up just to define it. So you look at the symplectic orthogonal to the tangent space of the submanifold, and you want this to be contained uh, in the tangent space itself, so, right? So this is the set of vectors in the tangent space to M, such that omega of V, once you plug in V in the symplectic form, it vanishes on the tangent space to the co-isotropic submanifold, to the submanifold. So if a manifold that has such property is called coisotropic, uh, and these are studied extensively in symplectic topology. It turns out not so much in contact topology. So examples include Lagrangians and hypersurfaces. These are really studied a lot in symplectic topology, but not so much in contact topology, because I even had a hard time finding a definition of a coisotropic submanifold. So one could for um, the question then is, does the same result hold for in, in the contact set? Oh, I didn't state what the result is. So here's the result of Humilier, Leclerc, and I uh, about co uh, coisotropic submanifolds. So suppose C is coisotropic uh, and phi is a symplectic homeomorphism and phi of C is smooth. So it's a smooth submanifold, and, and what we showed is that, in fact, then this forces phi of C uh, to be coisotropic. Okay, and now the question is, how about the contact analog of this again? Does this hold for uh, a reasonable definition of a coisotropic submanifold uh, in the contact setting? And so, what should be what's the definition of coisotropic submanifold? Uh, so it takes C in a contact manifold. I say it's coisotropic. Uh, if its lift to the symplectization is coisotropic in the symplectization. In the symplectization in Y. OK, and, and this is a definition that's appeared in a few papers and people have proven things. I think it's, well, it's formulated differently, uh, but, but Yang Huang seems to have studied this, uh, among others, uh, including Usher and, uh, and Rosen and Zhang and others. OK, uh, and so this is an interesting open problem as well. And here's why I, I think it would be interesting to prove the Lejeune results for uh, non, uh, for non-closed Lejeunians is that the the, the proof of the coisotropic rigidity theorem in the symplectic setting uses to, to uh, uses the fact that the image of a non-closed Lagrangian under symplectic homeomorphism remains a Lagrangian, and, and so presumably, if you could prove the same statement for non-closed Lagrangians, then you'd get this coisotropic the answer to this coisotropic question as well. Okay. So, Any questions? Yeah, I have a question too. Anne. Um, so I guess, for example, like in, in contact, you have this foliation probably, no, by, uh, yes. and, and so you say that, uh, that your map preserves the property of being co-isotropic, but it also preserves the, uh, the foliation or? Right. So, uh, this the symplectic theorem, I get, I didn't state the full statement, right? It preserves the foliation as well. So, uh, the phi sends the, uh, C and phi of C are both coisotropic, and furthermore, phi sends the, co the characteristic foliation of C onto the characteristic foliation of phi of C. Okay, that's a part of the statement of uh, this theorem uh, here. So the foliation, uh, I'll just write the word foliation here. So there is a statement about foliation as well. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. uh, the, the, the problem with the contact setting, I, I looked into this, it's not clear whether there are there exists a foliation for coisotropic submanifolds in contact setting, but it's a similar foliation. It, it could have, uh, it could be non, you know, it's, it, it, it's not, there's a foliation, but then there, it has singularities. Uh, so since I got a little confused when I looked at the definition, uh, I decided not to say anything about the foliation. But uh, I suppose you could ask, the you know, you could extend this question and say, what happens to the foliation, to this single foliation under the contact homeomorphism? 
Is this what you were going to ask about? Uh, well, in this direction, now yeah, you take over twisted disc or so, and you say, ask yourself, uh, I don't know, is the image then over twisted disc or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was this type of question. Yeah. Thanks. Ah, uh, okay. Interesting. Uh, so then you wouldn't be able to construct, you, know, you might be able to, the way I've defined contact homeomorphisms, they're defined as homeomorphisms of the same manifold, but you know, you could say something, a map between two contact manifolds is a contact homeomorphism, if it's locally, can be approximated by contact diffeomorphisms. And you know, if what you said is true, then you, you'd prove maybe there's no contact homeomorphism between an overtwisted and a, and a tight contact manifold. That's seems like a nice question. Maybe, I, I don't know if that's worse or not. So, okay. Uh, so uh, I, I'm going to switch gears and talk about another question now. There's something that comes from uh, dynamics on surfaces. And I'll talk about Rochlin groups now. So no more coisotropic or Lagrangians. So what's a Rochlin group? This is a definition that's due to, that comes from ergodic theory due to Glasner and Weiss. Suppose you have a G, a topological group. We say G is a topological group, G is Rochlin if it has a dense conjugacy class. If there exists dense conjugacy class, so just to spell it out, i.e., we want a theta in G such that you know, uh, the conjugacy class of theta is everything. And so this is some a notion that actually seems to arise naturally in ergodic theory. Uh, I won't say anything about the ergodic examples that they have. So these guys have written quite a bit about this notion. But here's an example of a Rochlin group. Homeomorphisms of the two sphere or the co connected component of identity in, in homeomorphisms of the two sphere or any even dimensional sphere. OK, this is a Rochlin group. And it turns out to construct a conjugacy class that's dense, you need a certain amount of flexibility. And uh, so what allows you to construct a dense conjugacy class here is the fact that you can, in, you know, on the two sphere or on a, any even dimensional sphere, you could always shrink. So on the two sphere, let's say, uh, you could always shrink any large ball into a small one. So there is no area that's being preserved. And this is enough to construct a dense consciousness class, at least on the two sphere. Now, if you switch to the case of, so it's some sort of a, being Rochlin is some sort of a flexible property. Now here are some, so then you'd expect that symplectic objects not to be Rochlin, and this turns out to be true. So for example, area preserving homeomorphisms of the two sphere uh, is not Rochlin. This is not Rochlin. So this, this was actually a question of some of my friends here in Paris, Pégin Corvisien Leroux, who asked this question. And uh, I answered it for the two sphere. And by now it's been answered for many other symplectic manifolds. So you could ask more generally, uh, the group of Hamiltonian homeomorphisms of a symplectic manifold, is it Rochlin or not? And this has been uh, proven, for example, for surfaces. It's not Rochlin for surfaces. Or if pi 2 is 0. So this was in a work with Bohovsky and Humilier. And then some other cases have been done by others. So CPN, for example, by Shaluchen and others. OK, so this phenomenon of being not, uh, not in existence of what obstructs 
non-existence existence of dense conjugate classes is certain symplectic invariants. Unfortunately, I don't think I'll have time to say much about it, but the question I want to ask or propose is, how about contact homeomorphisms? So take the group of contact homeomorphisms, and is that what we know about? Could it have a dense conjugacy class? And I thought about this a little bit a few years ago, so, uh, but we never managed to actually write anything down. So Matsuchelli and I thought about this a few years ago, and we thought we could convince ourselves of the following. So the contact world seems to be a little more complicated. There's more flexibility, but there's still some rigidity. So it turns out, we, we think, although I'm not 100% sure, because I would bet a beer on it, but not you know, a thousand beers. Uh, so we think uh, R2n plus 1, uh, here I want to take the uh, compactly supported contact homomorphisms, is roughly. Okay, so here it turns out you could construct a dense conjugacy class. And the reason here is that this is the reason is existence of because of contact squeezing. So there's a really nice example of why uh, of a homeomorphism with a dense conjugacy class, but I guess for lack of time, I won't say anything about it. But then you know that this. What allows you to construct a dense conjugacy class is contact squeezing, but there are certain manifolds on which you can't squeeze stuff. And an example is R2n times S1. And here, uh, we think we can show it is not roughly. So there are no dense conjugacy classes. And uh, so, okay, so the question remains is that, uh, you know, it's a mystery to me. How, when is it that you can prove a manifold is Rochlin, a contact manifold is Rochlin, and when is it it's not Rochlin? And, and, and that's, so maybe I'm out of time. Uh, 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 I guess I'm going to leave it at that. And I won't say about my next question. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Savan.